Hello, everyone, and welcome today to the Introductory Tribal Juvenile Policy and Code Development Course, Session 1, Designing and Reforming Your Tribal Juvenile Justice System, Big Picture Considerations. We want to thank you for joining us today on behalf of the OJJDP Tribal Youth Training and Technical Assistance Center. And I will be facilitating today. Uh, my name is Anna Rangel Clough, and I work here in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And I will be assisting our guest presenter, Pat Sika Kwaptuwa, as she presents uh, resources, information, and training to support you in the development of your tribal code. Uh, this is a five-part series, and we are so glad that you're joining us. And so we're going to get started here uh, with an opening and then an overview of today's session. So at the center, we like to open in a good way. And I just wanted to share a few words uh, on Muskogee Creek and Uchi. And I just wanted to tell you all welcome and uh, that we are having a beautiful day today here in Oklahoma. We're finally getting some rain and cooling off. And I don't know where you're joining from, but I'm sure um, that we're all having a great day, I hope. And um, if you want to share in the chat box your name, where you're from, uh, and something that you want to accomplish this year. We like to open in a way that we share um, and greet each other, so feel free to say hello, say where you're joining from, and if you want to share something that you would like to accomplish this year in your job, in your personal life, um, a personal goal that you have, um, we just want to give this time over to each other and um, share how we're doing. So go ahead and use the chat box in the bottom left. And here at the TA Center, we have a, a staff um, that come from many different tribal communities. And so we welcome you here. Um, many of us speak different languages. Um, but just to share with you, um, I hope that the giver of breath blesses your work. Um, and I hope that Pat is able to share with you today some resources that will um, support your work in your community. And we are so glad um, that you're here today. So keep, keep typing. Welcome, everyone. Um, I see a few of our TTA staff have joined as well. And thank you to all who are sharing in the chat box. So I'd like to uh, give an introduction of our presenter today. Um, this series is a five-part series, and so um, Ms. Sika Kwaptiwa will be presenting on all five of those, and then we will also have an additional guest facilitator um, later in the series. But I'd like to read a little bit about Pat's work and um, why we chose her to help support uh, the communities that we serve here at the Training and Technical Assistance Center. Um, so Pat joined the faculty of the University of Alaska Fairbanks in 2015. She works in the Department of Alaska Native Studies and Rural Development. Um, she has research and teaching areas uh, in many different um, areas that pertain to Native communities, um, but in economic and community development, tribal sovereignty, governance, management, tribal courts, and conflict transformation. Um, she is a nationally known presenter and trainer on tribal law, court development, and conflict resolution topics. And she presently serves as a tribal judge, arbitrator, and mediator. She sits as a justice on the Hopi Tribes High Court in Arizona. She formerly served as a co-founder and executive director of the Nkwotsvuat Institute, a nonprofit and tribal community mediation program on the Hopi Reservation. She has also served as a director of the UCLA Native Nations Law and Policy Center in its Tribal Legal Development Clinic and part of the UCLA School of Law in Los Angeles, California. Um, as a director of that clinic, she provided instruction and supervised legal clinical projects. Um, she is also one of the co-founding members of the Tribal Law and Policy Institute and has served as an associate director, ongoing consultant, and serves on the board of directors. Um, in the spring of 2014, she moved with her husband to Fairbanks, Alaska, 
and her husband, Dr. George Rice, works as a private family practice doctor in Fairbanks. And so we are so proud to have um, Pat with us, and we are so honored that she would um, share some of her time and, and continue to support communities in this work. And so um, thank you, Pat, for joining us today. And I'm going to let you um, give an overview of the learning objectives um, for this particular session. Thank you, Anna. Can you hear me OK? Yes. OK, good. Um, so I wanted to overview the learning objectives for today. And um, the primary learning objective for today's part of the five-part series is to look at the various processes that make up a complete juvenile justice system. We're going to look at the parts of those processes and the purposes of those parts. Uh, another important thing that I want you to get out of this is that there are model juvenile delinquency um, laws that, that cover the area of both um, juvenile delinquency and what we call status offenses for tribal courts. And so we'll look at a couple of those models. And then the third and fourth aspects here in the learning objectives are that there are old or legacy tribal statutory provisions that exist out there. And we're going to look at how they're different from the models. And then we're also going to go back and look at the models to see where there are what we call statutory doors to special programs. So these are provisions in the law that give us a way to leave tribal court process and go and uh, have youth participate in other programs. So those are the primary learning objectives of this first session for today. Thank you, Pat. And um, as we said before, because this is a multi-session series, if there's any topic that um, happens to extend over into another session, we will be archiving all the sessions online. And so if you miss a portion or there's a session that you're not going to be able to be present for, we will have an archive version of all of these webinars at the conclusion of this series. And so thank you for sharing those objectives for today. Um, we did want to ask a few questions just to get to know those of you that are joining. And so we have a question, in what role do you currently serve um, within your tribal community or within your justice system? And we're going to bring that poll up. Feel free to share. So we have um, several of you are, are responding. And Pat, I know you can also see we have um, several of you from social services and family services, substance use prevention and treatment. Um, we see that there's a couple of possibly guardian ad litem or cost of workers. And other, if you are in an other role, do you mind sharing in the chat box what your current role is? Um, we try to. Um, capture many of the different roles that would be um, present today. But if your role, if you don't see your role there and you want to mark other, please let us know um, how you currently serve within the justice system or within your tribal community. Thank you all for sharing. I see we have some judges and attorneys. And so we'll keep that open for just a few more seconds. So um, for those of you that are joining, we know that um, some of you may be OJJDP tribal grantees. And the OJJDP Tribal Youth TTA Center serves CTAS Purpose Area 8 and 9 tribal grantees. And if you download the slides, you can see um, some resources like our website and other information. If you are not an OJJDP tribal grantee, you can visit tribalyouthprogram.org to learn more about our center. And um, if you have questions or comments or anything you need to know about the series, feel free to put those in the Q&A box um, as we move forward. So we have a follow-up question, um, polling question number two, just to get a feeling for how many of you are working currently on your juvenile code. We can pull that up.
and that is, are you familiar with your existing juvenile code or policies? So feel free to share here. We'd like to get a feeling for how many of you are currently working on the development of your juvenile code or you're working through your policies. And if so, um, if you're a Healing to Wellness Court, please feel, feel, to, feel free to share um, if you're currently working on your Healing to Wellness Court policies. We'd love to be able to assist you further with that. And we're just going to keep uh, reading some of those responses that are coming in. We see that some of you are working on your Healing to Wellness Code on tribal truancy codes. Um, you're currently working through it to revise it, and you want it to meet your needs better. That's a really good reason for revising and developing your code um, to better meet the needs of the community. Um, we see uh, someone's familiar with the current children's code, but also working on your wellness code um, as a section within your children's code, and where there's co no code existing. And so, um, Pat, I'm glad that we got these responses because we can get a feeling that you know people are coming from different places. Some of you are probably um, deeper into revision than others, and other others may just be getting started. So it's good to know um, the different places in development that you all are in. And we have one more question that we want to ask right now, and that's just talking about um, your previous efforts um, within the community to develop or amend your tribal juvenile code. And these, these polling questions, they're good for us um, as presenters and facilitators to help understand where you all are coming from. So I greatly appreciate you all sharing um, any responses that you guys have. So if you want to just describe um, previous efforts to develop or amend your tribal juvenile code, and that could be policies as well. We, it can be open-ended there. So any efforts that you've been involved in or that you're currently involved in, to amend the Tribal Juvenile Code. And I know that this will be a, a point of discussion probably ongoing throughout, but um, I know that I myself have been involved in code development projects, and we know that they can be arduous and take a lot of time, um, but at the same time, we're really happy that we can come together as a group for this course and hopefully support you all as you either um, begin or continue working in um, the revision or development of your juvenile codes. So, so we can see that um, some of you are coming from a point of not yet having um, had an effort toward revision or development, and some of you are. And some of you are, let's see, I see a year into your title, um, that you know it hasn't been updated in quite a while, so amending is something new for this tribal administration. I and mean, that's something that might come up for many communities. Uh, in one administration, you might start a code revision project, and then you have a changeover of administration, and so it becomes almost a new project if you have to get new um, stakeholders and leadership involved. And so definitely understand that as a, a part of the revision or development process. So thank you all for sharing. We are going to save these, and we'll read over some of these responses, and it'll help uh, with future sessions. And so we're going to go ahead, um, Pat, I'm going to let you get started and move into the content portion of this um, session. And if there's any questions, again, please use the question and answer pod, and we will either stop intermittently or, or go to the end, depending on where we're at in the content. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, the title of our presentation today, as Anna has previously noted, but I'll, I'll say it again here, is Designing and Reforming Your Tribal Juvenile Justice System, Big Picture Considerations. This presentation, as well as the following presentations, are based on the Tribal Law and Policy Institute Tribal Legal Code Resource. This is a, an online publication that was put together, um, I think the final version came out in 2016, 
and it's a guide for the drafting or revising of tribal juvenile delinquency and status offense laws. In particular, we're going to be looking at part two of the guide and chapters six, seven, and 21. Um, the links for these materials are on slide 32 of this PowerPoint presentation. And the guide itself, um, if you want, in, in, you know, prior to our presentation to read up on some of the chapters, you're welcome to do that, or, of course, after the presentation as well. Um, one note, I tend to use the terms statute, laws, and code interchangeably. Uh, I know that there is a, a practice or a trend among tribes to use the word code when referring to their statutes and laws. And I actually think this is something we inherited from the uh, Code of Federal Regulations and the BIA many years ago when tribes adopted provisions from the Federal Code of Regulations. So I prefer to use the word statutes and laws, but I'll also use the word code just so we can communicate. OK, so let's go to our first slide here. And maybe we'll go a little further. Let's go to slide 11. So there's one central question that will impact how you view the drafting and structuring of your juvenile laws. And I tried to pull this out or tease this out from all of the material because I think it's a really important question. And it's this. When we look at the misconduct of youth, are we seeing symptoms of something that may be cured, or are we seeing criminal activity and the makings of a criminal? If you're a person who sees symptoms, you're more likely to want to structure therapeutic interventions for you into your tribal law. If you're one who sees uh, criminal conduct or the makings of a criminal, you're more likely to want to structure in transfer proceedings into the uh, criminal process with criminal prosecutions and penalties. Now, I do uh, realize that there's a balance to be struck here. And I think the answer to this question and the decisions you make about the structure and balance of your juvenile law should be based in a data-driven assessment of the needs and realities of your community but not necessarily the mere opinions or value judgments about youth in your community. You really want your answer to this question to be data-driven. Um, and of course, the way that you or your community leans um, in answering this question is going to affect the structure of the law that you draft. OK, so there are four scenarios that are important for you to sort of lock into your mind when we talk about juvenile law structure, because this also affects the way you design your law. So I want to talk about these four scenarios here um, in three ways. I want to look at sort of the dictionary definition of, of each of these scenarios. I want to look at the model code provisions, and specifically, I'm looking at model tribal code provisions from 1989. So in 1989, the National Indian Justice Center developed the Tribal Juvenile Code. Um, we also call it the 1989 BIA Tribal Juvenile Justice Code. Um, and it's a good, simpler base model code to look at. Now, there is also a 2016 Model Indian Juvenile Code put out by the BIA. And you might ask, why are we looking at the 89 code instead of the 2016 code? And the answer is, is this. Um, uh, the TLPI tribal um, legal code resource that we're working from was drafted before the 2016 code was finalized. Uh, so that's a very practical reason. But there's another reason, which is that we need a simpler teaching framework to start from. And the 2016 model code is like the Ferrari of model codes. It assumes that a tribe has a lot of resources and funding, uh, particularly for defense attorneys for youth. And most tribes don't have that full array of resources. 
Uh, so we start with the 1989 code as a better um, base model for teaching and comparison. The third thing I want to look at when we look at these four scenarios is real life examples of the scenarios. Uh, and I particularly just combed newspaper articles and internet articles for that purpose. Okay, so let's look at these four scenarios. So the first scenario is truancy. Um, and I have this little cartoon here. I don't want to go to school. I hate school. I'd rather do anything than go to school. So truancy is all about school. And the dictionary definition is um, the action of staying away from school without a good reason, or absenteeism. So how does this show up in our model tribal code? Well, it doesn't show up under the word truancy. It shows up as part of the definition of family in need of services, or what we call FINS. So the FINS um, category is defined as a family whose child, while subject to compulsory school attendance, is habitually and without justification absent from school. So I, I want to just step back from this for a moment and note that if you see a symptom here, absence from school, you're more likely going to want to um, structure some interventions for, you know, what, what is this a symptom of in this family's life? And, you know, how might we want to intervene as a tribe or a school at this point? As opposed to viewing truancy as a crime that needs punishment, and you'll see that the model code is really seeing more of a symptom because they call it family in need of services instead of the criminal act of truancy. So that's a very, um, that, that really indicates the way that the model is approaching this uh, from a more therapeutic intervention perspective. Okay, so I pulled a, um, a story from the internet. This is Indians.com. And I was curious to see what's going on out there with truancy. And so I pulled this story from the Lane Deer Schools on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation in Montana. And they're talking about how they have very low attendance in their school systems, a 67% daily school attendance record, and how this is unacceptable. Um, to be fair to their system, apparently in Montana, uh, state law requires that schools that are having students with attendance problems have to send them to the lame deer schools. So they are collecting a lot of students with attendance problems. So the tribal leaders in this article are, are complaining about how there's no teeth in the tribal law, that they need stiffer penalties for parents and youth, and that the home environment have problems like substance abuse, overcrowding, hunger, poverty, unemployment. So the way they're talking about the problem really um, indicates to us what their answer might be to that very first question. There is a view that perhaps a more, um, you know, that, the, that we're not seeing symptoms, that we might be seeing crimes, or if we are seeing symptoms, maybe they're better handled with a punitive structure. So you can see that the answers to these questions are really in debate in tribal communities. Uh, okay, so that's an example of a real life scenario for truancy. Okay, let's look at child maltreatment. So I went to the Child Welfare Information Gateway to take a look at how they're defining child maltreatment. And they include in the definition both abusive children and neglective children. They include both acts and omissions. So it's not only what someone does to a child, it's what they don't do to a child. And these are the kinds of acts and omissions that have to be reported to Child Protective Services. These include physical abuse, neglect, emotional abuse and sexual abuse. So a, a broader category, more than physical abuse alone. The 1989 model code that we're looking at does not address child maltreatment. 
And we're going to talk about this some more in later slides. Um, but basically, um, the thinking is in the model codes, and, and those of us who are looking at the, these statutes, is that we should be separating out the, the laws that govern child maltreatment from the laws that govern juvenile uh, delinquency offenses and status offenses, because they govern different things. One of the things that's really clear here is that when we're talking about child maltreatment, the primary actor is the parent, guardian, or custodian. So the statute is really governing their behavior and reacting to their behavior. In the juvenile scenario, the primary actor is the youth, and the statutory provisions are really governing um, reactions to their behavior. So these are very um, different scenarios. OK, so let's look at a real-life example of child maltreatment in the headlines. So this is an article from Newsweek. It's actually an opinion piece in Newsweek. And um, to be transparent here, it's really um, a bit of an argument against the Indian Child Welfare Act. But it is an example of child maltreatment from the headlines. So I share it here. And this is a very sad story about um, twin baby girls that were in a foster family. And then when they were about uh, three years old, they were taken out of their foster family and placed with their grandfather and his wife, their biological grandfather. And then within a month or so of being placed there, um, the twins were harmed. The, the wife pushed them down a hill, and one of the children died. And so this is a very clear symptom of physical, or I mean, a very clear example of physical child abuse and murder, possibly, in this case. Um, so this is a very um, current, I think this was 2015, actually, uh, example of child maltreatment in the physical abuse category. And I only present it here as an example so that you can see what the scenario is capturing. OK, I want to contrast the child maltreatment and truancy scenarios with the juvenile offense scenario. So let's take a look at slide 17 and look at the De dictionary definition of juvenile delinquency or juvenile offenses. So the dictionary definition is that these are the habitual committing of criminal acts or offenses by a young person, especially one below the age at which ordinary criminal prosecution is possible. So usually 18 years old here. And the model code defines a juvenile offender as a child who commits a juvenile offense prior to the child's 18th birthday. And then a juvenile offense is a criminal violation of the law and order code of the tribe which is committed. So a juvenile offense under the model code is really reference, referencing another tribal law which is either the tribal criminal code, or in many tribes, they call this the tribal law and order code. And in that criminal code, they're defining the crimes that, when they're committed, um, are subject to criminal prosecution in tribal court, uh, things like theft, for example. And so if a child, someone under the age of 18, commits one of these, then they fall under the definition of juvenile offender under the juvenile law. OK, so let's take a look at the headlines on this one. So you don't have to Google very long before you find out that there are many articles um, capturing the crisis in Native American juvenile justice. And so this is an article from corrections.com. Uh, it's a 2014 article. You could probably find more current articles. Um, this one just had a lot of good stats in it. I should say terrible stats. Uh, they talk about how um, Native American juveniles um, represent a higher percentage of the youth arrest in theft and alcohol possession, how Native um, 
juveniles are committed to adult incarceration at higher rates than white youth, how they're placed under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system at much higher rates, and that in states with substantial native populations, they represent, for example, 29 to 42 percent of the juveniles that are held in secure confinement. They talk about how much higher the alcohol-related death rate is among Native youth, 17 times the national rate. The suicide rate is triple the national average for males 15 to 24. The high school dropout rate is the highest of any racial group. They talk about how young the Native American population is relatively. Um, for example, in 2008, the median age was 28 years old versus 35 years old for the U.S. population as a whole. So this means that these native youth issues impact a larger proportion of our total Native American population. And then they go on to talk about other factors, the poverty rate, the high school dropout rate, the low baccalaureate degree completion rate, very few of them are going to college and finishing college, the high victimization rate, um, and then that experts believe that about 200,000 Native Americans under the age of 19 suffer from serious emotional disturbances, about 10 percent. So I, these statistics are not a surprise probably to any of you who are working with tribes and native communities today. Um, they are terrible stats. And uh, the reason that I do this work, I work in a rural development department where, in a university where the majority of my students are native. I would say over 80 percent of my students are native. They're young adults. And we're training them to be the leaders of our tribes, of our native corporations, of our communities, you know, to be our visionaries and our advocates and our activists. And we need more of them at the university level. So when I contrast the need that we have in our system for educating these young people uh, for our future with the statistics about our youth, um, there is, this is a very important area to focus on. We need to be moving these young people from these horrible statistics to a place where they can be our, our future and our leaders. So I find this work incredibly important, personally. All right, so I diverged from my scenarios there a bit, but this gives you um, some really good material to look at in thinking about that original question about are we seeing symptoms of something that can be cured or are we seeing criminals in the making, particularly when we look at juvenile offenses. Okay, so the last scenario is status offenses on slide 19. The dictionary definition of status offenses are activities that are deemed offenses when committed by juveniles because of their age at the time of the activity. But these things would not be illegal if they were done by an adult. So some examples of status offenses include not attending school, breaking curfew, running away from home, uh, possession and consumption of alcohol. Although I put a little asterisk on this one because in many tribes, Alcohol possession and consumption is defined as an adult crime in the tribe's criminal code. So that one can be a juvenile offense instead of a status offense. But assuming that it is not defined as a crime in the tribe's criminal code, we will call it a status offense. So the legal theory of why uh, a tribe or any government and its court get to define and enforce status offenses is called parens patriae. And this is the principle that a political authority carries with it the responsibility to protect its citizens. So a tribe carries with it, and tribal courts, the responsibility to protect tribal member children. Um, 
and you know any children really within its jurisdiction. So that's sort of the basis of why um, there's a power on the part of tribal governments to be characterizing status offenses and intervening in them in their court systems. All right, so let's take a look at the 89 model code. So the 89 model code, again, places these under the definition of family in need of services. So a family in need of services under A is a family whose child, while subject to compulsory school attendance, is habitually and without justification absent from school. And we've seen this one before under truancy. Or it's a family where there is a breakdown in the parent-child relationship based on the refusal of the parent's guardian or custodian to permit the child to live with them or based on the child's refusal to live with his parent's guardian or custodian. So what it, I want you to notice that under this breakdown in the parent-child relationship under B, it, it has a lot of, you know, a lot of that breakdown can show up in, in other ways. For example, um, if there is a breakdown, a child might run away. Or they might be ungovernable. I'm looking at the pie chart to the left. Or they might not be coming home. There might be curfew violations. Or they might not be going to school, truancy. Or they might be using drugs and alcohol, um, liquor law violations. So. This FINS definition can capture a lot of the aspects of uh, what are showing up as the primary uh, status offenses across jurisdictions on the pie chart. OK, let me show you a newspaper article. So on slide 20, I found an article from the Seattle Times on homelessness. I was trying to figure out how does this um, sort of breakdown in the relationship between parents and children manifest in what's happening in the news. And the way it manifested pretty quickly was in homelessness. So this article from the Seattle Times is about um, a woman named Bridget Davis. And she's homeless. And she talks about how that when she was about 10 years old, she started to be afraid to go home because of her mother's struggles with alcohol addiction. Uh, and this is on the Yakima Reservation in Washington. So as a result of that, she ended, sleeping, ended up sleeping in the park. And apparently, a lot of Native people sleep in this park near Pike's Place Market, and so much so that it's called the Native Park. And Davis, uh, Bridget Davis, ends up saying, I used to think I was going to die in the park like my elders. So this article is talking about how um, Native Americans and Alaska Natives in King County in Washington have the highest rates of homelessness, um, even though they're only 1% of the county's overall population. They're nearly 6% of homeless. And that a lot of them um, die. They are subject to violent displacement. They're homeless, and they can't find housing. And so we do see um, the ramifications of what started out as a status offense, a breakdown in parent-child relationship. We do see the ramifications showing up in homelessness here. Okay, so. Let me just pause here before we go to the next session and see if there are any um, questions or comments so far. And I think you could, uh, Anna, do we want this in the chat block or the Q&A block? Um, if they have a comment, they can put that in the chat box. And if they have a question, if you enter it in the Q&A box, we can answer that. And I believe if you ask a question, it will just go to us as the moderators. It won't go to the whole group. So if you, if you have a comment about any of this prior section, feel free to chat in the chat box. OK. 
All right, I just wanted to touch base there for a second. Um, it's looking like people are not having questions or comments yet, so I'm going to move us on. And if you do, go ahead and feel free to type it in as I'm talking. Okay, so I'm going to take us to slide 21. So this diagram on slide 21 is showing you a potential um, tribal juvenile justice system with all the bells and whistles on it. And what we really are focusing on in this webinar series are tribal statutes that deal with juvenile issues that are not child maltreatment. So basically, the second and third boxes under the tribal court uh, header here in the diagram, juvenile court and juvenile healing to wellness court. Now, the reason that I include the children's court or the child maltreatment box is that in researching uh, tribal juvenile codes all over the country, we're finding that many of them merge or mix provisions from the child maltreatment category with the juvenile category, and that this is not a best practice. practice. Um, both of them are civil uh, court processes in nature. In other words, they're non-criminal. Um, and they, they have a different kind of scheme that looks more um, like therapeutic intervention. But the juvenile court processes are quasi-criminal. Uh, and this has to do historically with the way that juvenile court systems and laws developed in the, in the state. And then when they were copied over into the tribal context, we carried over some of that old quasi-criminal uh, character in both the way that juvenile court processes are run and in the laws that are applied in them. So it doesn't make sense um, to lump these two together. So the children's court, which governs mal child maltreatment, as we go forward, will not be something that will be included in the model code provisions that we're looking at. Okay. Uh, one more point uh, terms here. So when I talk about tribal courts, I will often use the term docket, D-O-C-K-E-T. Dockets are um, defined as the caseload of a court or a judge. And they come in certain types. And these types are the scenarios that we've been talking about. So a children's court handle the scenario of child maltreatment. The judge is looking at those types of cases. In a juvenile court, the judge is looking at the scenarios usually of juvenile delinquency and status offenses or juvenile offenses. Um, we're also calling status offenses family in need of services. So those are the types of scenarios handled by a juvenile court judge. And then a juvenile wellness court judge um, may handle overlapping scenarios that look like juvenile offenses and status offenses and family in need of services, but there's an added layer. Those youth also have a drug and alcohol use problem. Um, and so that juvenile wellness court docket um, is dealing with a subset of youth that the juvenile court docket would be handling. And then in many tribal courts, um, particularly if they have multiple trial judges, they will assign a certain judge to a certain docket. So you may have a tribal children's court judge, or a tribal juvenile court judge, or a tribal wellness court judge. And that just means that their caseload is made up of those kinds of cases, those specific kinds of cases. OK, so let's kind of walk through this diagram and understand who the potential interveners are. Um, whether we're looking at symptoms or criminal conduct, there are different interveners, and they are not all the tribal courts. So on the upper 
left-hand corner, we see the school. And this is just a reminder that schools have their own assessment and disciplinary processes. So they have their own, like, mini quasi-judicial process, if you want to think about it that way. So schools also um, intervene sooner than a court will. They see things sooner. They see, they see people being absent from school. They see family problems sooner. And so they may have their own internal rules and regulations that deal with handling those problems with families. Also below that box is law enforcement. Law enforcement also, they're the first responder often. Um, they see problems in the community right away. I mean, they're going to see curfew violations. They're going to see um, any criminal conduct like theft. Um, and so it's possible in some communities that the school and law enforcement will work together with the community to create a program that is outside of the tribal court. And in some communities, this is a teen court program where they work with youth to set up their own little court system, in a sense, that is outside of the regular court to handle what would usually be a family in need of services issue, like truancy, um, like a breakdown in the, in the family parent-child relationship, um, all those other things we looked at, like being a runaway, using uh, alcohol, um, any of those status offense type issues, and, and maybe even some juvenile offense type issues. So if your tribe or a tribe has a teen court program, that's excellent. Or any other community program that's coordinating with law enforcement in the school. So it's actually a preferred thing to catch those status offenses outside of the tribal court system and get them intervened with in a way that um, cures the problem. But let's say that doesn't happen. Or let's say your tribal community doesn't have the resources to have this extra tribal court program that's outside of the tribal courts. In that case, um, your cases are going to start coming into tribal court involving youth. And they can come in in, in these three places. Um, the youth or the child could be abused or neglected. Then it goes to children's courts. Or um, the child has done some misconduct that has caused them to be charged with a juvenile offense um, or a, have a complaint filed against them in juvenile court. So they come in under the second block under tribal court. OK, so let's say they came into juvenile court and they found out they had a drug or alcohol problem. In that case, they are diverted over to the juvenile wellness court docket. So you can see how there's sort of multiple places where youth get implicated in the system here. All right, so there are also a number of other places that the tribal court judge can send youth that are outside of the formal tribal court process. Or maybe it's a hybrid and it's attached to the tribal court process. And we call these referrals, diversions, or dispositions. A referral is when they're simply referred to another program or part of the tribal court system. And it's usually done by a court staff of some sort, but not necessarily the judge. A diversion can be done by staff um, and it means they're diverted to a special program, often a juvenile healing to wellness court program. A disposition is a court order. So that's where a tribal judge is actually disposing of the case with a court order and ordering someone to, to participate in something. So some of these some things include things like family group decision making, family group conferencing, family mediation, peacemaking or circle process, victim offender mediation, circle sentencing, or other culturally tailored mentorships or activities. Just, this could be anything in this last box, 
whatever that particular tribe or community considers important for the upbringing of the youth. So each of these terms uh, that I'm including in these prior boxes here, from family group decision making to circle sentencing, these are terms of art in native uh, and tribal justice circles. Uh, and you can look them up. Um, it's relevant. We will cover them in future sessions. But they actually are very specific sets of uh, processes and even code provisions that set out how each of these things work. And you know, there's, uh, they may take the form of uh, statutory provisions, or they may be policy and procedures. Um, some of it could be subject to custom and tradition issues. Um, but I just wanted you to know that I made this list of different kinds of referrals, diversions, and dispositions for you so that you could go and look it up. OK, so that's the big picture um, of what is possible for a tribal juvenile justice system. So you might ask me, does any tribe actually have all of this? And my answer would be no, probably not, because this is a lot, it's pretty resource intensive, probably pretty expensive. Um, then you might ask me, well, do any tribes have a lot of this? And I would have to say, yeah, there's probably a few that have quite a bit of this, um, but most tribes do not. And there are also quite a large number of tribes that have only block number two, which is the juvenile court. And when I see a tribe that only has block number two, that's often an indicator to me that it's leaning more um, uh, in answering our very first question about symptom or criminal conduct, it's leaning more towards the criminal conduct view in answering that question, either because it inherited very old um, BIA or state versions of a juvenile law or because they're choosing to answer the question that way. Um, so minus all the bells and whistles here, you have less therapeutic interventions for youth. And then you're more concerned, in effect, with punishing them and holding them accountable and perhaps public safety issues than you are with um, intervening uh, with therapeutic interventions to launch them on a different path. OK, so I'm presenting these in pretty stark contrast. But the reality is, um, in your tribal juvenile system, you are, on occasion, going to want to have provisions available to handle youth in the criminal justice system. And this usually takes the form of transfer proceedings or provisions in the law that give you circumstances where you can transfer a youth from the juvenile court block number two to a criminal, adult criminal court, would be, which would be like a block number four here, not on the diagram. And you might ask me, well, when would you ever want to do that, and why would you ever want to do that? And the answer is uh, because sometimes, once in a great while, you may run across a young person whose conduct is so dangerous to public safety. and um, and, and so uh, not appropriate for the, the status offense and juvenile offender system with therapeutic interventions that you have set up that they need to be processed in the criminal justice system. And I am hopeful that this is a rare scenario, but you might want to have provisions in your law that allow you to respond to that situation for the sake of public safety. Um, and you might need the punitive accountability segments of it as well. But um, absent that uh, scenario, um, I think the majority of your youth would greatly benefit from all the bells and whistles in this, the way you want to design it for your tribal system that has more opportunities for therapeutic intervention. OK, so I may have said some things there that were kind of controversial or debatable or um, that you might want to have a response to. So are there any questions, answers, or comments at this point? And Anna, do you have any uh, comments or questions? 
Yeah, I did want to add, um, I know for, for those of you who may be utilizing federal funds to help support um, the development of your wellness court or other funding streams that um, place limitations or um, caveats regarding violent offenders. And so I know that may be a consideration um, when you're developing policy um, is to review uh, your funding agreement uh, in relation to any of those stipulations that you may need to be concerned about. And what exactly is the um, federal uh, requirement, Anna? W what can they not use their funds for? So specifically, I know in the most recent CTAS application and then funded awards in 2017, you may want to look at violent offenders. And I can actually pull that statute up and put that in the chat box. Um, that's in the initial solicitation. And so when you um, signed any of your agreements with um, your funding agency, if you are utilizing funding, um, that is something that you should pay attention to. And so I will highlight that and put that in the chat box. OK, thank you. And then I want to stress that that doesn't mean that you can't have all the, all the aspects of your laws or your statutes and provisions that you need for your system to operate in any circumstance. But it's more of a case-by-case -case, um, application of you know, which particular youth can access which program and be eligible for which program. So that's, that's um, outside of the statute. That tends to be more in the policies and procedures. Um, so it might, uh, it might not have the same like, direct implication for the statutory provisions. Right, and I think there's also, um, when you get into theoretical discussion about um, felony offenses and the tribal court itself, um, there may be a discussion there related to um, a juvenile offense. Can it be um, prosecuted as a felony, or is it going to be a misdemeanor? Um, ongoing. So I know that's probably a heavier discussion we could get into um, further down the line in these sessions, but I'm copying and pasting that um, section from the solicitation now if you are a CTAS Purpose Area 8 funded grantee. Okay, thank you, Anna. All right, let's see. Did anyone have any other questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. All right, so I will keep going. Um, so I wanted to say a little bit more about the difference between uh, the child maltreatment scenario and the juvenile delinquency status offense scenario, which also includes the family in need of services. So these two um, different scenarios have terms of art in the law. They call the child maltreatment scenario a dependency process. So you'll often hear someone say, oh, you're talking about dependency court. Well, when they say that, they're talking about the child maltreatment scenario, also known as children's court in tribal court. And when they're talking about um, juvenile offenses, status offenses, and family in need of services, they're often uh, talking about what we say, uh, we call it delinquency. So they'll say, oh, well, you're talking about delinquency court or juvenile court. And so one of the things that some folks on the call who are from tribes where they conflated these in the law, children's court will mean to you both of these. And so what I'm asking you to think about is splitting out your law and your docket so that you have a child maltreatment um, cases in, in one law, and you have juvenile delinquency status offender family in need of services cases in another law. And that it's that second column, that juvenile court column, that we're really talking about in this series of um, webinars. Uh, and when we're looking at the model laws, it's that second column. OK, let's see. OK, let's go ahead and stop and answer the question. So I'm not sure I'm seeing the question. 
I just, if you click the view, I'm going to click the presenter view, and the question is, what if you only have one judge for everything or every court? So that is okay if that is what your caseload requires. Um, it just means that that judge has to know how to do all these different kinds of dockets and case scenarios. Um, certainly a law trained judge would be able to do that. Um, otherwise, you need to make sure your judge has, if it's a lay judge, that they have training across these different scenarios and how the law is different. Um, also, I noticed that some tribal courts just put these different caseloads on different days of the week. So Monday at Hopi, for example, is criminal arraignment day for adult criminals. So that docket happens on Monday. Um, that might not be as easy with uh, child maltreatment cases, which just pop up when they pop up and you have to handle them right away. Um, but it's OK if you only have one judge as long as they have the training to do what they need to do. Any other questions, Anna? Not that I can see right now. OK. OK, cool. All right, so back to slide 22. OK, so there's another. Um, there's another, another subtle distinction between the, the, the children's court and the juvenile court here. And children's courts are considered to be civil courts under civil law. In other words, they're non-criminal courts. And juvenile courts in tribes are also considered to be civil courts. In the state system, they sometimes are uh, quasi-criminal. but in tribal courts, we, we tend to want them all to look civil. And there, there's a good reason for this. because It has to do with jurisdictions. And it has to do with federal Indian law and the limits that the, the federal government places on tribes, uh, particularly tribes in public law 280 states. Um, and it causes us to want to uh, characterize and structure our juvenile courts as civil courts so that the tribe, through its tribal sovereignty, has more power to handle cases involving youth. And so that's a really um, compelling reason for structuring juvenile courts to be civil and not criminal. However, even though we do that, um, because so many tribes have copied their laws from either really early um, code of federal regulations provisions or state court juvenile proceedings, sometimes we accidentally copy in quasi-criminal provisions into our tribal laws. I see this a lot in tribal codes, especially older ones. And so it causes us, um, if we follow the rules that call that court criminal, it causes us to treat our youth like little criminals and, or, or alleged criminals. And so we need to comb through our existing provisions to make sure that, um, that they are looking more civil and also that they have all the therapeutic interventions and doorways that we want to be able to help our youth and not just funnel them into the criminal justice system. Um, so that also makes the, the juvenile court docket different than the children court, children's court dockets that deal with maltreatment. And it's another reason why we should separate them out. All right, so let's look at some of the details. So the children's court handles, um, it protects children, and it's looking at the conduct of parents, guardians, and custodians. The juvenile court is habilitating and rehabilitating adolescents. And that's usually um, children older than 10, you know, like 10 to 18. Uh, some tribal juvenile courts and some state courts as well increase the age of juvenile court um, jurisdiction to 21. And um, those who are studying adolescent brain development would even go so far as to say 
25 because they argue that the adolescent brain is not fully developed until about age 25. Um, and so some tribal juvenile codes, some state juvenile codes extend the jurisdiction of the court over adolescents to higher ages than 18. Okay, so let's look at the second line here under children's court. Um, okay, so I've stressed this already. Um, it's usually the parents who are on trial in a children's court. And in juvenile court, it's usually the adolescents or young adults who are on trial. In the children's court, there's a different standard of proof. Usually, um, the uh, presenting officer or the you would think of them as the prosecutor, maybe if this is on TV, the presenting officer in a children's court has to, uh, has to prove that a parent, guardian, or custodian um, abuse the child by a preponderance of the evidence or some other civil standard. But in juvenile court, um, the presenting officer has to prove the guilt of a young adult or adolescent, maybe it's theft or something else, beyond a reasonable doubt. And it's a criminal standard. Um, and I'm not actually advocating for lowering that, lowering that um, standard of proof here, um, but it, um, this is a long conversation. But basically, I just want you to note here that the standards that are typically applied are different in children's court and juvenile court, which is another good argument for separating those codes out from each other. Also, in children's court, the supervision and plans for parents are usually focused on what the parents need to do. And then in juvenile court, the, um, the statutory doors to diversion programs for youth are usually youth-focused and family-focused, but definitely youth-focused. And then finally, in the children's court, um, the, uh, children are placed and guardianships are established for children. And that can happen also in the juvenile court. But also in the juvenile court, it's possible for youth to be put in secure detention. It's basic, basically juvie, you know, it's juvenile jail. And that can happen in addition to all those other placements and guardianships. So there are real differences between these systems. All right, so I want to change, I want to shift topics here just slightly. So I'm on slide 23, and I want to talk about how the processes are different within juvenile court itself. And the model code, that 1989 code that we're looking at, creates two different court processes under the juvenile court box. So if it weren't complicated enough that we have all these different dockets in tribal court, once we start talking about the juvenile court docket, there are actually two different processes in the code. So one of these processes uh, deals with juvenile offenders, and one of these deals with status offenders. And I, when I say status offender, I'm including family in need of services. So it's juvenile offender slash status fins. Um, and there's two different court processes for these categories. So let's just take a, let's just compare these two court processes for a moment. So if we're talking about the scenario of delinquency, this is where uh, a youth has allegedly committed um, a crime under the tribe's criminal code, like theft for example. If we're talking about a status offense slash FINS process, we're talking about the scenario like um, the breakdown in the parent-child relationship, things like not going to school, like running away, like possessing or using alcohol. It's a status offense. Okay, so you see the difference here. The conduct is crime in one column, and in the other, it's a status offense. Okay, the second difference is, is the answer to the question, can this kind of conduct be eligible for the youth being transferred from the juvenile court 
to the adult criminal court. And when we're talking about juvenile offenses, the answer can be yes. If we're talking about status offenses, the answer should be no. So your law should be uh, splitting those out. Um, what about custody and care? Well, if we're talking about a juvenile offense, then secure detention or juvie is a possibility. It's not a requirement, it's a possibility. If we're talking about status offenses, those should only be subject to temporary shelter care where you aren't putting together youth in juvie with status offenders. Or maybe I should flip that around. You aren't talking about putting status offending youth in a same facility as juvenile offending youth or juvie. And also, it's, it's time limited. If it's a status offense, you may be only putting them in shelter care for hours or days. OK, so what about adjudication? This is the trial in tribal court. What about the trial in tribal court? Um, what are you trying to prove? So if you're the presenting officer in a juvenile offense case, you're trying to prove that the youth is a juvenile offender, that they've committed a given crime under the tribe's criminal code. If you are uh, a presenting officer and you're in tribal court and it's a status offense, you're trying to uh, uh, prove that this family is in need of services. And then you're going to argue what services they need. So you see the difference here. One of these looks like more like a criminal process, and one of these looks like um, it's a little more <laughs> it's a little more civil. Um, but both of these processes exist in the model code. Why you might ask? Well, you're going to have different youth with different conduct and different realities. Some of them may be more dangerous. Some of them may be earlier in their conduct and Maybe it's more of a cry for help, and you can intervene and get them off the track they're on. Um, some youth are maybe dangerous to the public. So you're really sorting cases here. Um, and you might ask, well, who does this sorting? Is it the judge? No, it isn't. It's actually the presenting officer or who you might call a prosecutor in tribal court. Um, this is a function of that office inside the tribe. Uh, they decide whether or not to charge somebody with a juvenile offense or whether they're seeing a family in need of services. Uh, and I can already tell that some of you may ask, well, what if you don't have a presenting officer or a prosecutor, particularly in Alaska or in another place that doesn't have the full array of positions? And so what we do see, and I, I don't recommend this, but we certainly see it, is sometimes a tribal uh, social worker or social services officer ends up serving as the presenting officer in these cases. And then it's they who are making the, the decision about whether to file a juvenile offender complaint or whether to file a petition for family in need of services. OK, so the last difference here is disposition. What happens, what does the judge say should happen to the youth in these processes? So if it's a delinquency process where there's a juvenile offense alleged, here are the possibilities. The judge can order them to stay home with certain conditions. Um, and those might include things like treatment and counseling, um, school attendance, et cetera. They can be placed, they can be ordered to be placed with a relative with those same conditions or other conditions. They can be ordered to pay restitution to any victims of their crime if they stole something or broke something or graffitied something. They can be ordered to do restitution. They can be put on probation. Um, if you have a purely quasi-criminal system in your tribe, you're probably using a probation disposition. This is not my favorite uh, arrangement, but I see it all the time everywhere. Um, you can call it probation, but it's still conditions. 
You can also have the possibility of a judge ordering secure detention. And this whole order, this court order, should uh, terminate when they turn 18 on their 18th birthday. And that's because the court, if it's a court that only has jurisdiction over them until they're 18, it just doesn't have the power to keep bossing them around after they're 18. Um, but if it's a court that extends jurisdiction until they're 21 or some other age, um, then it, the order will terminate then. Okay, so how is the court order different if it's a status offense or a FINS? Well, in the model code, they actually make these um, dispositions less onerous. Um, for example, um, of course, they can still be ordered to remain at home with conditions or be placed with a relative with conditions. Um, they can also be referred to services only without all the conditions and supervision. They could just be referred to services. They also can be put in shelter care. Remember, this is not juvenile detention or juvie, and they can't be mixed with juvenile offenders. They are put in some other kind of care, like foster care maybe, um, some type of foster care, and it's limited to 30 days max. They also can be confined, um, oh, I'm sorry, they cannot be confined with juvenile offenders and they cannot be put in an adult jail, absolutely not. And then this order is set to terminate at six months or upon their birthday or whenever the court's jurisdiction ends. Um, but six months is the max. Okay, let me just stop there for a second. Any comments or questions? Or Anna, do you have any comments or questions? Um, I think just knowing um, from the participants now who are in, um, you know, we're looking at the model code, but does this look similar to how their system is currently developed? Because I know in the tribal courts that I've worked in, it's very similar. Um, even if it didn't follow a model or, you know, copied and pasted from a state code that looks like this, um, pretty similar is what I've seen um, in practice. That's good. I'm glad you're seeing that. But certainly 10 years ago, we were not so much seeing the model code. The 1989 model. Um, all right, let's take a look at the next slide. Uh, Anna, what is my time at this point? So we have about 40 minutes remaining in total. If we're going to leave questions, um, about half an hour or so. Okay. Okay, we're good. We're really good. All right. So uh, I'm going to take us to slide 24 then. And I just wanted to say a little bit about these magic words, subject matter jurisdiction. And um, I, I can see that we don't have um, a lot of law-trained folks on the phone, so I'm just going to pause for a minute and think about this. Um, I think the easiest definition I can give you of subject matter jurisdiction is that it, it is a statutory provision, so it's in the tribal law. And it's usually um, the powers that the tribal council gives to the tribal court and tribal judges over a certain uh, set of scenarios or subject matters, um, types of cases. So uh, that's often why you'll see tribes calling their child maltreatment laws. They'll call them the children's code. And then they'll define um, what is child abuse, what is child neglect, what, what is uh, child sexual abuse, um, that's subject matter jurisdiction. There, it's the types of uh, case scenarios that that tribal court and those tribal judges are authorized to handle in the tribal court. And we've been talking about um, these things as symptoms and conduct in our scenarios. Uh, and so you start to see how the way that a tribal council defines its subject matter jurisdiction for its tribal court really depends on what kinds of symptoms and conduct it's seeing in the community. Um, if you're seeing a lot of meth use, 
uh, then you're going to want to have provisions that deal with meth. If you're seeing more alcohol problems, um, you're going to want to have provisions that deal with that. Um, do you want to have provisions for all the possibilities? Sure. But there may be new possibilities. I mean, there's new drugs popping up all the time that the law has not addressed. Um, so I do think it's important for you to assess what you're actually seeing in your communities uh, so that your code provisions can cover most expansively the necessary subject, jurisdiction, subject matter jurisdiction or symptoms and conduct that you're likely to need to handle and intervene in in your community. All right, so I wanted to sort of um, Dia with diagrams show you what I was seeing when I was looking at all the tribal laws a, a number of years back. And so this um, first diagram is looking at the jurisdiction of juvenile court under the model code in blue. And then I'm going to show you what I'm seeing with other tribes in orange or yellow here. OK, so I'm on slide 25. So under the model code, the 89 model code, uh, a juvenile court is set up to handle two different kinds of cases, juvenile offenders and family in need of services. Also, we're calling this, uh, I've been talking about this as status offenses as well. But tribes have um, explicitly talked about this as a status offense category, not a family in need of services category. At least um, five years ago, when I was looking at tribal codes or juvenile codes nationally, I saw more of this status offender bubble in their, uh, both in their subject matter statements, their subject matter jurisdiction statements, and in their definition sections. Um, and so how are these things different? Well, we've already talked about how um, under the model code, a juvenile offense is a criminal violation of the tribe's criminal code, but it's committed by someone under the age of 18. And then we've already talked about how family in need of services is defined as a child that is habitually without justification absent from school, or there's a breakdown in the parent-child relationship. So we're really familiar with those. Um, Status offense or status offender is often defined in tribal codes in the definition section, and it can be a lot of different things. So I wanted to show you what I was seeing. So I take examples here from Blackfeet and Leech Lake. Um, my guess without looking it up again is that these are probably codes that are about 10 years old. It could be five years old. Um, I'd have to really go back and dig to see what I was looking at here. So in Blackfeet, they are defining status offenses as curfew violations, which, we, which sounds like what we've been seeing, loitering about games of chance, so gambling, loitering about, well, I should say loitering around gambling, uh, loitering about retail liquor establishments, Possession of alcohol, possession of drugs, truancy, inhaling, and motor vehicle violations. Um, and then we'll compare with Leech Lake. They also have curfew. They also have truancy. Um, they also have possession uh, and consumption of alcohol and controlled substances. They, they add uh, possession and consumption of tobacco. They also have inhaling. Uh, they add misuse of over-the-counter drugs, um, disorderly conduct, and running away. So the, the lists are a little bit different. Um, also, I highlight in red, and I should have done that with disorderly conduct as well under Leech Lake. I highlight in red those provisions that in some tribes are also adult crimes in the adult criminal code. I'm assuming that they are not in Blackfleet and Leech Lake, or they wouldn't have listed them as status offenses. Um, so what jumps out at me from this? I suppose if these tribes have a separate family in need of services process that's 
separate from their juvenile offender process, then, uh, and these are included as FINS, there really isn't a problem. Um, however, if they're processing these using more of a juvenile offender process, then they're lumping together um, youth and treating them the same uh, in a more quasi-criminal process. And so some thought has to be taken to think about um, what you consider to be a juvenile offense in your system that will be handled by a more quasi-criminal process and what you consider to be more of a status offense that should be handled more like a FINS or family in need of services process with a lot of therapeutic interventions and diversions, et cetera. Um, okay, I think that's all I want to say about this. Uh, any questions so far or comments? I think we have a question. I'm going to pull that up. And Gandra, you might have to help me pull that up here. I see is, I don't know if there's a question or a statement about attempting to submit a foreign sample on a UA. So I'm thinking your analysis test. Okay, can, can the uh, person who typed that in just say a little bit more about it? Like, what is the question? The question reads, is attempting to submit a foreign sample on UA considered status offenses in anyone's code? Oh, I see. Is this a healing to wellness court question? The participants are muted. I'm going to put this in the but chat box. He, he stated yes. Right. Yes. So this is an interesting question because basically what you're asking is if a youth is in a Healing to Wellness Court program and they're trying to cheat on their drug testing or their alcohol testing, um, is this a new offense or is it a new crime in a sense that they could be charged for in a juvenile court. So, it, so this youth is in that, um, in that number three square on our, on our diagram that's the Healing to Wellness Court docket. And remember, we still have the number two square that is the juvenile court docket. And if youth who are already in a program are committing new offenses, theoretically, they could be processed as an, a new offender back in that number two square juvenile court docket. And so this is a question for the designers of your policy and law in your tribal court. Do you want people who are participating in your healing to wellness court to be able to be charged with new crimes in the, or new offenses in the juvenile court? while they're in the Healing to Wellness Court program or docket. Um, there are, there's pros and cons to this. I mean, the big con is that you might be yanking people out of your Healing to Wellness Court program when they're better handled in that program by that judge who can just sanction them in some smaller way um, instead of causing them to um, have a whole bunch of new offenses in the juvenile court, which also might yank them out of the program. Um, so I would talk to your Healing to Wellness Court team about whether you want that to be a status offense. Um, and my gut reaction is they're going to say no. Um, or only certain really extreme kinds of cheating or maybe recurrent cheating at a high level would qualify or potentially qualify as a status offense. I, so my bottom line answer is this is, a, this is a question that should be put before your, your Healing to Wellness Court team and judge when you redesign your laws. Okay. Any, anybody else before I jump to the next slide here? 
Okay, I'm going to jump to the next slide. Okay, so now I wanted to show you the, the court process for status offenses or family in need of services. And this is the model code process, so it's the preferred process, um, as opposed to processes you might see in your existing law. So let's take a look at this. So the first process here is coming from sections 117 and 119, um, the family in need of services proceedings under the 1989 model code. Um, and of course, links to the code can be found on slide 32 when you, when you exit this lecture. Um, please go to those links and take a look at the code provisions. All right, so let's take a look here. Let me just get my notes. All right, so I'm going to sort of walk you through this diagram. So first off, you might have a request from a service provider or someone in the community or law enforcement. The tribal court is going to get a request for a family in need of services um, processing here. So that's the first thing that happens. Someone knows of a family in need, and they want them to be um, process through the tribal court, and so they, they make a request. And then what happens is that um, there's someone in this tribal court with the job title of juvenile counselor. And this juvenile counselor under the model code is supposed to do a preliminary investigation of this request. And they're going to inform the youth and the family members of their rights. They're going to do um, an investigation, and then they're going to form, uh, I'm sorry, they're going to conduct an informal conference with the youth and their parents. And hopefully, this comes out with a written agreement for six months of what things they're going to do and what services they're going to participate in to um, assist them with their needs, whatever symptoms are causing them to come in. This is called an informal adjustment. And so this process of informal adjustment, nobody's gone before a judge. This is all happening in the tribal court with court staff, but not before the judge, no hearings, nothing yet. So this informal adjustment is either successful, um, and at six months it's just done, and the whole thing um, is, is done, and there's no more court process or it's unsuccessful. Um, if it's unsuccessful, then that juvenile counselor is going to file a formal petition with the tribal court, which is with the tribal judge. And this is called a FINS petition, a Family in Need of Services petition. There's another reason why the juvenile counselor might do this. Um, sometimes um, certain agencies or service providers, either in the tribe or with contracts with the tribe, will only provide services to that youth and his family if there's a court order. And this is really annoying because it causes us to have to process youth through the tribal court and cause them to have the stigma of a tribal court um, record um, just so that they can access services. And so as a whole, we need to give some thought to this service requirement. Um, but nevertheless, that's the reality right now in many tribes. So sometimes, even though an informal adjustment in six months would do the trick um, and everything would be fine and this youth would have no record, sometimes they need to access mental health services or something else. Um, that's going to require a court order. So a FINS petition has to be filed so that they can then have a judge say, you are ordered to these services, and then somebody will provide the services and pay for it. Okay, so there are multiple reasons then why a FINS petition would need to be filed. So once that petition is filed, then the judge is going to schedule, or the court clerk is going to schedule a preliminary hearing. And at this preliminary hearing, um, they usually do um, they usually do a baby hearing before they do a real trial-like hearing, and they call this a preliminary hearing. 
And they do this, um, if it were in a criminal court, they're doing this because they're allowing a defendant, a criminal defendant, to plead to whether or not they're going to plead guilty or whether or not they're going to say they're not guilty and then hold the trial. And that's a later hearing. Um, and if there is to be a later hearing, there might be motions made by lawyers about evidence or other things, um, timing. Um, so that's why they hold these baby hearings um, called preliminary hearings. But in the model code, um, one of the purposes of the preliminary hearing is to allow for this motion to be filed called a, a motion for a consent decree. And this motion is usually filed by a juvenile presenting officer or a prosecutor. And they may be filing it um, on their own. Or um, it may be filed by the youth or the parents or the guardian or the custodian of the youth or the lawyer for any of those people. Um, and it's basically a motion to say, can we continue the arrangement that we had before under the informal adjustment? Um, there was an agreement about um, you know, services that would be provided and conditions. And we just want to continue with that arrangement. And the judge can grant it or deny it. Um, the other possibility is that no one makes that motion at all. And um, or the judge doesn't want to give them that possibility, so he denies that motion. So the prelimin preliminary hearing really addresses these motions for consent decrees. OK, so let's assume that um, the judge denies that motion, and the whole thing proceeds to a full-blown SINs hearing. So at a full-blown hearing, you can think of it like a trial. The judge is trying to decide whether this family is a family in need of services. And he looks at clear and convincing evidence. Um, the presenting officer has to demonstrate by clear and convincing evidence that this is a family in need of services. And remember those two definitional categories that um, uh, he's proving that the child has to go, is supposed to go to school but isn't going to school. Or he's proving that there's a breakdown in the parent-child relationship here. And if the presenting officer can prove this by clear and convincing evidence, then the judge is going to find that this is a family in need of services. And then the judge is going to schedule a disposition hearing. This is a third hearing now. And issue a disposition order. So at the disposition stage, the judge is going to uh, take any reports or studies about the family and the, the situation of the family. Maybe um, there's evaluations of mental health issues or substance issues, um, the home environment. Um, the judge is going to take these reports and um, think about them, consider them. Um, and then he is going to also take recommendations about where the child or youth should be placed, um, what conditions that the youth and family should be subject to, whether um, social services should be given supervision, uh, protective supervision over this youth and family, whether they should be referred to services and treatment. Um, whether there should be a transfer of legal custody either to a relative, uh, a shelter care facility. Um, but there can be no placement of the youth in a FINS proceeding in a juvenile detention or penal facility. So this process does not allow uh, that youth to end up in juvie or end up in jail. That's not possible with a FINS process. OK, so, um, so I wanted to make the point, when you, when you step back from this diagram, it, that these big blue circles are doorways. They are places where, in your law, you can refer, divert, and or order a youth 
to a community-based program or to a therapeutic court docket, like a healing to wellness court. So if you have, um, if it happens at the informal adjustment bubble, then it's a referral. So the juvenile counselor is just referring someone to participate in a juvenile healing to wellness court. If it happens as part of a consent decree, um, that's approved by a judge, but it's also an agreement. Um, it, it, one of the conditions could be that they participate in a juvenile healing to wellness court. If it happens in a court order, like a disposition order, the, the judge can be ordering them to um, juvenile healing to wellness court. So these are all potential doorways to send someone out of the juvenile court process, whether it's the FIN status offender process or the juvenile offender process. Um, now, there are some other fancy mechanisms for doing this, and we'll talk about that in the, week, the last seminar, the last webinar that we do when we talk about juvenile healing to wellness court. Um, there, there's all kinds of um, strategic ways to move cases out of the juvenile court into the juvenile healing to wellness court. But let's consider that an advanced topic that we'll cover when we have a little more under our belt here. Okay, any questions or comments so far? Do you see someone is typing? Okay, no new questions. All right, let's go. Uh, do we have 20 more minutes total or 20 more minutes considering time for questions? Um, we have 17 minutes left total, so about 7 to 10 minutes for content and then the remainder for any questions and wrap up. Okay, all right. I, and I do see there is a question. Oh, I can't see the question, but I know there is a question. Okay, in all FINS hearings, are the parents providing an attorney if they cannot afford one? So if that is, um, it, of course, they're, they're entitled, oh, if they're entitled to have an attorney if they pay for it, for sure, uh, under the 89 code. Um, under the 2016 uh, BIA model code, they definitely are guaranteed an attorney at the expense of the tribe. So um, when we come to that uh, section of our webinars, I'll, I'll go back and take a look and maybe do a comparison of the 89 and 2016 codes so you can see which provisions you prefer. Um, certainly we want that to be a paid for attorney, but it really is a matter of resources for particular tribes tribe by tribe. And I, I do understand that um, not everyone has the same resource capacity. Anna, did, you, did your group have sort of a position on this in terms of the code? On um, the provision hey. of an attorney? Yeah. Um, I think generally it comes down to, like you're talking about, the capacity of the tribe itself, the resources available. Um, you know, I think that most people would want to ensure that families coming into the court do have representation um, and that due process element there, but that, you know, we also understand the limitations of the court. And so, you know, definitely looking at um, Popper's affidavits and other items that can assist the court with um, deciding who will need who needs counsel at the expense of the court itself, um, and then looking at your court's capacity to provide that. So a lot of considerations would go into that. Okay, I think that's also my answer. All right. So given the time, the amount of time we have left, I'm going to jump us forward to slide. Well, I'll do 29 skips the header. So uh, I want to compare this FINS process or the status offender process under the model code, the 89 model code, with the juvenile delinquency juvenile offender process under the 89 model code. So let's take a look at slide 30. Um, you already see from the very first words here that 
this is more quasi-criminal process. So we have an alleged offense. Let's say our youth is alleged to have stolen something from someone. Um, and we have the job uh, title again of juvenile counselor who investigates. Um, the juvenile counselor under this process can choose to, after they investigate, take no further action to um, send it to informal adjustment or to file a petition with the court. And this would be a juvenile offender complaint. Um, let's see, there would be, let's assume that it doesn't go to informal adjustment. So again, it goes to a preliminary hearing where the youth can either plead or admit guilt um, to having done it. Um, assuming they don't plead guilt or that they don't admit to having done it, then a second hearing or a trial called an adjudication happens. And the judge is looking at whether the child committed um, the juvenile offense as defined by the Tribal Criminal Code, uh, the judge will hear and take evidence and the prosecutor or the presenting officer will have to prove that they committed this crime beyond a reasonable doubt under the model code. Assuming they do, um, the, the judge is going to schedule a subsequent hearing. Um, it, it is still a disposition hearing under the model code. But in many tribes, they'll call this a sentencing hearing. And so um, if they do a sentencing hearing, again, the judge is going to take any reports or studies about the, the youth and his or her family. Um, they're going to order uh, in the court order here uh, supervision, care, rehabilitation. They might allow the youth to remain in the home with conditions. They might transfer legal custody to a relative or other suitable person with conditions. They also may order restitution. They may order that the youth um, pay back or um, make whole the person that they victimized. Um, they might place the youth under protective supervision of social services or a facility. Um, they might put the youth on probation with conditions. They might place the child, I shouldn't say the child, they might place the youth in a juvenile facility that has to do with alcohol and substance abuse treatment. Um, they might be placed in an emergency shelter or a halfway house or a foster home. Um, it is possible, too, that they get placed in a secure detention facility if they're a juvenile offender. So you'll see that the same blue bubbles here exist as points of referral or diversion to other uh, community-based programs or therapeutic court dockets. So we have the same possibilities with SINs there. But the big difference here is that um, it's more of a, a quasi-criminal process and secure detention is a possibility. All right, let's go to the last slide here. OK, so the big implications for what kind of process you set out, and particularly for your findings and purposes in your juvenile law, um, are whether or not you're going to, um, I almost want to add a bullet here, whether or not you're going to take out those child maltreatment provisions and let them be their own separate law. And then the second bullet here is whether you're going to split out status offenses from juvenile offenses and give them different court processes like we've been looking at on these last two slides, right? And the really big difference is that the end dispositions are different. You, you know, you can't place status offenders in, uh, in juvie. Um, also, uh, uh, juvenile offenders have to um, make reparations for things they may have done. And then we're, the model, the 89 model, is recommending the use of a family in need of services type process for status offenses um, instead of the juvenile offense process. And then I've been asking you throughout this lecture to think of status offenses as symptoms that require intervention instead of 
conduct that is criminal. And I've also been asking you, when you actually go to make a list of your status offenses, that you base these on hard data about children, adolescents, and young adults and their families in, in your community. What are their challenges? What are their needs? What kind of symptoms arise because of these challenges and needs? You know, how is your system intaking youth? Are they, are they intervening therapeutically, or should they be, and if so, where? And ask yourself, what do our youth and families need based on these symptoms? What kinds and types of community-based services and programs? Um, and again, base these on, on hard data as opposed to value judgments and opinions. Um, I guess the last thing I would say is that um, I've seen really great tribal youth programs out there. Some of you may be them. Um, so I know this can be done when it's a priority for a community and they're really working together to design a system, you know, do the assessment and design a system that responds to it. And so I'm really hopeful that we can lock down these innovations um, in a way that's reinforced by the tribal laws. And I, I do endorse the 1989 uh, model code. Um, and also, I, I very much like the 2016 code, but it is the Ferrari model. And as we go forward, I'll try to point out the differences so that you can make an informed decision about what would fit your system. OK, I think that's my last slide. Um, the resource slide is slide 32. Um, what you'll find in these links are um, 1989 code is the first thing here, the National Indian Justice Center code. I've given you the link. Um, and then the model uh, 2016 code is at the next link. The juvenile code resource chapters are then the remaining links on this slide. And I hope you take some time to go look at them. OK, Anna, I'm going to turn it back over to you. OK, we do have um, one question in the chat box. And it, it's, it was in two parts. but. Um, what are some accountability methods used in the informal adjustment process rather than court orders? And it was kind of coupled with a, with a statement about MDTs working in the FINS process. Take the acronym again. What working in the FINS process? Uh, MDT, I think it means multidisciplinary team working in the FINS process, and then accountability methods for youth. Okay, well, that is a great question. Um, I don't have a, a simple, clear-cut answer for you. Um, I would have to go out and research some of what other tribes are doing. And this does not show up in the code. Um, so I think, um, what, is, what is something I could say that would be helpful? For, I think I would have to go research it and come back to answer that question. But it's a good question. And I think, too, when we get to um, the Juvenile Healing to Wellness session, um, when we're talking about accountability, so moving a youth into a diversionary proceedings, such as the Wellness Court or whatever other diversionary method you guys have in place, um, there, there are accountability methods there, such as you know sanctions and incentives that can be utilized to support um, youth accountability within the wellness court. And so maybe it's not necessarily occurring at that very first um, FINS um, you know, court order, but if you move them into that diversionary process, developing youth-focused accountability measures there um, in those particular processes that you implement. That, that's an excellent answer. The Healing to Wellness Court is a giant accountability method. Exactly. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping before we move to our final um, polling question. Um, one is, again, it's a, a five-part series. We've just completed session one. Thank you, Pat, um, for delivering all of that information. Please download the session presentation in the download box, and you can have access to those resources that she included on slide 32. And that will also provide you with um, 
you know, an ability to read through many of the conversations that we had today um, since those resources discuss um, what we talked about in this session. Then, in addition, if you are a tribal grantee or you're joining and you want some more individualized assistance looking at your policies, procedures, and codes, if you can email myself, you can copy Pat as well. Um, there is an opportunity for a limited number of participants to actually have um, some more developed consultation in the, in, during this series. So if you want to have her review um, your policy, procedure, or code during the course of this um, series, there is the opportunity to do that. I'm copying Pat's email address in the chat box now. And they're also, I think your address is also on the slides, correct, Pat, at the end, I believe. We have it in there somewhere. Um, if not, our email address for the TA Center is in the slides. And then I'll also copy my email address in the chat box as well. If you have questions about any of the remaining sessions, you can email us anytime. And we will send out a reminder for the next session um, if you registered for this. But please remember that you need to register for each session individually so you can go back to the training announcement and register for the next session if you have not done that already. Um, and we'll have a, an evaluation. Um, please give us feedback. And we're going to do our last polling question. It's just about um, if you were able to gain some knowledge today. I know that I certainly did. And I appreciate Pat um, very much. And we're going to look forward to our next session. That will be coming up, I believe, on the 14th, if I'm not correct. So thank you so much for the feedback. Um, it looks like everyone that joined today um, was able to gain some knowledge related to today's topic. Pat, do you have anything that you want to say before we close out? Just thank you, everyone, for participating in this. I think the more that we focus our attention on the code reform, um, the more likely it is we'll get some really good codes out the other end. Yes. I'm typing my email address in now. Feel free to email Pat directly or copy me um, in support of review of policies, procedures, or codes during the course of this series. Uh, we will do some follow-up individually with those of you who reach out. And we look forward to seeing all of you in session two. And with that, um, please take our evaluation. The survey is there at the bottom of your screen. You can click on it, and it will bring the link up. And email addresses are in the presenter contact information and in the chat box. So thank you, Pat. We will see you in the next session. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your week and weekend.